Well, thanks for coming. Um, this class is not an hour of technical jargon where you're all going to fall asleep. This is more techniques, ideas, things surrounding the print process, how to be creative about it. So it's all the, it's all the stuff that you don't find on the Canon website or that sort of thing. How many of you printed in the darkroom? Curious. How many of you enjoyed printing in the darkroom? <laughs> how many of you print digitally? And how many of you enjoy that? <laughs> That's pretty good. Once I had one hand go up, you know, the guy in the back, and everybody looks at him like, what is wrong with that guy? <coughs> but um, so my name is Evan Parker. I am here on behalf of Moab. I actually bought Moab paper long before I knew that what they were and who they were and that sort of thing. It was, it was my favorite. I started out in the darkroom. I was lucky enough to grow up in the darkroom. When I was little, I'd go down there with my dad, and I'd get to hit the print button that glowed in the dark and then watch the magic image. So this was, this was my base. I did it for many years. Um, I shot a lot of high school sports, shot a lot of my friends, film on deadline, that sort of thing. I have to say, when digital printing got decent, I was happy to abandon the darkroom, because I didn't have to have my thermometers and all the stuff and keep track of it and, and that sort of thing. So I've kind of moved on from photojournalism to uh, Architecture is mostly what I do now, a lot of interiors, residential, commercial, that sort of thing. And then I also print for some clients on the side, and I get to travel around and, and talk to all of you about, about printing and the process and all that sort of thing. These are a couple of recent <coughs> photos that I've done. So what are we going to do today? Today, we're going to master the print process. Start to finish, what are the main things to think about? Um, what maybe you don't understand, that sort of thing. I want you to be uh, friendly with your printer. Lots of people buy printers, they put them in the closet, and they're worried that if they open the closet door, money starts getting sucked in there, and they'll never see it again. Mm -hmm. So I want, you to, I want you to make peace with your printer and, and have it become part of your team. Uh, evaluate your prints. A lot of people come in and they say, is this a good print? Well, do you like it? And they say, yeah. I said, well, it's a good print. There's no holy grail of the perfect print that's, that's the last one you'll ever make. Um, how do you practically manage color, and how does that fit into what you're doing? How do you get to know the different papers? There are a lot of them. There are a lot of surfaces. They all project the image a little differently. And then take all this knowledge and make it part of the creative process so that when you sit down to start, you can have an idea of what the end result's going to be and that it's going to be what you wanted. Photos are everywhere more than they ever have been. The iPhone takes more photos than any other device in the world right now. And all those photos die in our phones. They're in there. You know, somebody hands you and they're going through it. And you're like, I saw my friend the other day. And you think, but to me, it's a picture when it's on your phone, it's a photograph when you print it. You don't go into a museum and see a bunch of screens on the wall. You see a bunch of prints. And, and the print is our traditional relationship with photography. When you have a print hanging in your house, you see something different every day. You see a little piece that's different. The lighting changes. You remember where you were when you took it, where you were when you bought it. It's our physical connection. They used to joke that the, uh, the PC was going to eliminate printing. What did the PC do? It put a printer on everybody's desk because we're we're tactile people. We like a physical product. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about color profiles. I have 11 printers. I have a lot of profiles. Your list will not look like this. And you can be very thankful for that. This is the biggest printer that I have. It's about 6 feet wide. It weighs about 300 pounds. That's about the right size. I bring this up because the ink's in it. <laughs> Ounce for ounce are the same price as Johnny Walker Blue. <laughs> Fortunately, you all haven't gotten there yet. But, but this, don't be afraid to buy your printer some ink, buy your printer a drink, take it out for the evening, and, and get to know each other. It's, it's always going to cost you a little bit to get started. But if you take the time to get to know how the printer works, how your work looks, how the different papers look, then you can take all that information and use it going forward and know where to start, where to continue from, that sort of thing. So where do we start? You want to start with the best image possible. How many of you shoot RAW files in your cameras? How many of you shoot JPEGs? Start shooting RAW files. You'll thank yourselves. If you look at music, it's a, it's a studio master versus an MP3. RAW file has all this data. 
and it gives you more options to distill it down. Storage is cheap enough. I always say, if you can, shoot raw. Color space is another thing that a lot of people don't talk about. Adobe RGB or Pro Photo is the newer one. Those are the biggest amount of colors we can get in an image file. The web likes sRGB, which is much smaller. Coincidentally, Lightroom's default export, for all those of you in Lightroom, is sRGB, which is almost all the files that people bring me for samples. The problem is you've taken all these colors and you've smushed it down to a lot less than it could be. So start with a raw file and make sure if you're exporting for printing, export it in Adobe RGB. I'll get you at the end. As kind of a visual representation, the solid in here is sRGB, the wireframe is Adobe. So anything that goes between those two, you lose if you export in sRGB. It, it has to crush it in. So you're not losing colors, they're getting <coughs> adapted into a smaller area is the practical application of that. Take notes. In the darkroom, we always took notes. You looked at your contrast filters, your time, your temperature, so that if I wanted to make that same print three months later, I could pull out my notes and I knew exactly what I did. As you take time in an evening or a weekend to sit down and, and start working with your printer or tackle an image that you've had trouble printing in the past, when something comes out that you really like, What'd you do? Write it on the back. The great thing about Inkjet is it's repeatable. So if you get one great print, your settings are all still there, put your notes on it, make another one, keep that one. And that way, when you start up six months from now, three weeks from now, whatever else, you have that little cheat sheet because I don't remember things that I did five days ago, and I do this stuff all the time. So always, always take notes. Don't be afraid to make a second print. And if something turns out really bad, what'd you do wrong? Keep that one too if you think you might do it again. We spend a lot of time talking about color profiles and that sort of thing. The biggest thing that you need to know is you always want to use a color profile. If you start looking at color management on the web, you can get lost for three days and you'll come up for air and you'll know a bunch of numbers and you won't be any smarter. It's, color is, a, is Alice's rabbit hole. Um, this is just a representation. That's the same plot that we had talked about. But color profiles, paper types, that's where most people get hung up. But at the end of this, do your prints look good to you? You're the artist. It's your eye. It's your vision. It's your work that you're printing. That's, that's the number one question. If you're happy with what you're printing, you're good. If you're stuck on something, if there's some technical piece, make it better. But if the prints that you're getting now you're really happy with, there's no, there's no higher level that you need to try to ascend to. So how do you know that your prints look good? Number one, if you're working in your studio or in your house, paint your walls a neutral color. I see a lot of people that have bright blue on their, on their office walls. Well, that bright blue is going to get reflected in all the color work you do on all of your images. Uh, years ago when I first started, I moved into a house that had an office painted that color. Would be fruit? We had to paint it out first. So you want to start with a neutral environment to adjust your photos. Consistent lighting for evaluating your prints is number two. My house looks out onto trees, so in the afternoon the whole house turns green because all the light reflects off the trees. So if you need to, at bright times, maybe pull down your blinds um, and have lighting that you can use to evaluate a print that's consistent all the time. So make sure that you use the same halogen light or that you use the same area to always look at the prints so that your light doesn't change during the day or throughout the printing process. You might make a print in the morning and then it looks different in the afternoon because your light source has changed. Now that we have a lot of LED bulbs that are really common, you'll see on the bulb packaging, it'll say CRI with a number. That's a color rendering index. 100% um, is the full visible spectrum. An inexpensive bulb at the hardware store is gonna be about an 80. You lose your blues and you lose your reds. So you won't see those colors in your prints. So if, if you can afford it in what you're doing, um, get just one good high CRI bulb, put it in a desk lamp, put it in a ceiling fixture, and use that to always evaluate your prints. And then you'll know you're starting from a good baseline. To give you a, an overview of what that is, um, the middle one here is halogen. So you have way over the red spectrum. That's why they're hot, because they produce a lot of infrared. An inexpensive bulb clips the reds and clips the blues. A full spectrum LED will get almost all of it. This will cut a little bit at both ends. 
and it's a real smooth look to the light. So that's gonna really help you to look at that print and say, gosh, that's, that looks good. And then also, no matter who you give it to, they're likely gonna have an inferior light source. You know it's gonna look good to them because you've seen it in all conditions. Now you can specify your color temperature when you buy these bulbs. 3,000 degrees is about tungsten since most photos are gonna get hung inside people's houses. That's a good one to start with. So you've painted your walls, you've got good lighting. Next one is, when you have those two, trust your eyes. You're the artist. You know, if it, if it looks good hanging on the wall in the room, you're good to go. So the next part is color management. Calibrate your display. Start with, start with a known variable. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, my display is terrible, but my prints look good. You know, I know what the shortcomings are. If it's just you and that's all you're doing, you can get by doing that. But the minute you send one of those files you corrected on your bad monitor or somebody else, they're gonna call you up and say, why is the sky green? So if you calibrate your display, you're giving yourself another known variable so that you know that those colors are accurate. Um, you don't have to go running out and buy a $3,000 high bit display, that sort of thing. If you have just an iMac or a regular desktop and you've got some glare, get some foam core and some gaffer's tape, make it a little monitor hood. That's what the fancy displays always ship with. That's gonna help you again isolate your viewing space from the rest of the world. Color profiles. We go on and on and on in printing about color profiles. So there is a unique color profile for every paper on every printer. They're all different, and that's, that's important. We make profiles for every printer that's out there for every single one of our papers. It's, it's a big job, and when they're done right, they're fantastic. So what does a co color profile do? It's, it's the secret sauce. It tells the printer how to mix inks to get the right colors, how much ink to put down on the paper, how to lay it down, if you're, if you're really into color management with the right hardware, you can certainly make your own. Um, and for the most part, we don't use color profiles when printing black and white, because for many printers, what the color profile will do is it will try to add color back into that image. So for any color image, color profiles every time. For a black and white, you're often gonna let the printer manage colors, and for most printers now, there's a checkbox that says black and white, or for Epson, there's an advanced black and white. That's what you wanna use if you're printing black and white images. This is a raw output from a printer. No color management, no nothing else. And that's with a profile. So that's what your profile is doing, is it's saying, hey, to get this color red, I need this much of this, this much of that, and out it comes. So that's no color profile, raw output, and that's with a profile. Every paper manufacturer should supply color profiles. Ours are all on our website. Um, pick your printer brand, pick your printer model, and they're all right there. Download them all. If you think you're gonna try a lot of the papers, install them all in your, on your printer, and you'll have, or install them on your computer, rather, sorry, and you'll have them for the rest of the time that you need them. When you're printing, you'll notice in your application, it'll say color profile, and then right below that, it'll say rendering intent, which is how you'd like the profile to interpret your colors. You want to use a rendering intent whenever you use a color profile, and I would suggest that you always begin with what's called relative color metric. And what a rendering intent does is you will always have colors in your image that are bigger than what the printer can do. They'll be way out in the orange, they'll be way out in the green, and the rendering intent determines how to move those colors into the printable space. Relative and perceptual are the two that you'll hear thrown around a lot. I like to start with relative because it's predictable. Perceptual can sometimes cause big color shifts, uh, and you mostly want to use it if you have a really saturated image. If you have a graffiti wall or a tropical sunset or something like that, perceptual will usually handle that well. But for most of your photography, when you print, you're going to get good results with relative color metric. And that's what we just talked about. So this is uh, CS6. It's pretty similar throughout the Adobe programs, but 
obviously I'm telling that I want the application to manage the color, not the printer. I've chosen my printer profile for the rag bright. And then right below that is where my rendering intents are. And start, start with a relative color metric. In the past, it was a big deal that you had to disable your printer color controls in a separate window since about CS5 and I want to say Lightroom 4, you no longer have to do that. Adobe is now properly communicating with, and, and also if you're using photos on the Mac or iPhoto from before, um, this is done automatically. But if you're consistently getting prints that are, have a really weird color cast or have a really weird saturation, look in your print settings and see if the printer uh, manufacturer color controls are turned off. They'll just be grayed out, but that's, you want to make sure that that's uh, done if you're having some problems with your prints. So the color profile and the paper type are separate, equally important, and they're kind of the secret handshake. So we've done color profiles, and now we're going to move on to paper types. Paper types are shipped with your printer driver, and they can't be changed. So I get a lot of calls from people that say, I installed your profile, and it doesn't show up on the paper list because we can't actually change that paper list. So when we make a profile, we choose the best match, whether it's matte photo paper or if it's a Canon photo paper pro platinum or, or Epson luster, that sort of thing. We choose one of those paper types and we make the profile. The paper type functions a little similarly to the profile in that it sets whether it's matte black or photo black. It does some ink density. It tells you how high you want that print head up. So if you're printing on a thick paper, it moves the head up and the printer will handle that paper. It also controls on a glossy, the application of a, a gloss optimizer. So on our download page that we just talked about for profiles, you see the paper name on the left, you see the media type or the paper setting in the center, and then you download the profile on the right. So for whatever printer you have, I recommend printing this page or making a PDF so that every time you go to print, you can refer back to it and you can say, oh, if I'm gonna print on the Juniper Beretta on my Canon printer, I'm going to select Photo Paper Pro Platinum every time. So you've got your ICC profile, your color profile. You've selected your paper type correctly. Those are the two main things in the print process. You start with your image, your ICC profile, your paper type, and 99 times out of 100, you should get the print that you were expecting on the paper that you chose. So the next thing to do is, just like we made test strips in the darkroom, Make comparison prints, especially if you're just getting to know inkjet printers and, and the, the printing system and that sort of thing. Pick four or five papers that you're interested in, or we offer a sample box that's two sheets of each. Pick an image that you love and print that same image on six different papers and get to know how a cotton paper changes the image versus a luster and, and what accentuates your creative vision best or what matches that photo. And take those six sample prints and keep them. Write your settings on the back if you need to, put that in the drawer, and then down the road you can pull those back out and say, oh, for this project I'd like a rag paper, or I'd like a metallic paper. And, and line them up, take a look. Everybody has their own preference. There's no right answer for choosing a paper. Some people like rich black, some people like a softer look. If you're, if you're really getting into things or you want to really see how a paper responds one way or another, this is the chart that I use for evaluating the technical merits of a paper. There are a whole lot of these online. They're all available from different color management companies and all over the place. They're all free as long as you don't try to sell them. Um, people have put these together. What you're looking for here is you have a lot of things. You have a black and white in the middle for tonal range. You have the colors down below to see am I getting shifts in certain colors, what can my printer reproduce, what color is out of its gamut. Down below we have a black and white gradient. You want to see that it's smooth from black to white without banding or without kind of funny hiccups in the transition. And then the bottom rows that are kind of hard to see on the screen, you have uh, little light gray boxes that show you where white becomes pure white and you have little black boxes that show you where black becomes pure black. So this is a nice comparison to see where's the black density of my paper, where's the white density. So if, you're, if you want to be a little more technical, download one of these. 
use the print settings, print that on a couple of different papers, and then you can really see almost scientifically how the papers compare to each other. So when we print that, what are we looking for? The smooth gradations, detailed in the shadows and the highlights, crisp edges. You want those little box to be nicely defined. If they kind of moosh into one another, then your paper setting is likely wrong. How's the fine detail in, the, in this one? In the little color charts in the upper left, there's actually some writing at the bottom of those that if you get out your, your loop or your reading glasses, if everything's good, you can almost read what it says on the bottom of those. Um, is there what we call bronzing or gloss differential? Do you see kind of a hard line between the bright white areas and the dark areas where maybe the ink's not getting laid down correctly? And on the other side of that, when using the correct color profile and paper type, if I run this on three different papers, it's gonna look very similar. The papers themselves change the look of the image a little bit, but it'll be real close. So that's another way to see if your settings are all correct. And as we talked about, once, you've, once you're learning all this stuff, make reference prints, keep your reference prints, take your notes. So a quick, a quick note on selecting papers. There are an incredible number of papers out there in the market right now. We have a, we have a huge range from cotton to metallic to some of the Japanese papers. So what are the terms? We've all heard matte paper. That's typically an alpha cellulose paper. It's a tree paper. It's a traditional smooth finish paper. Rag papers get talked a lot about, or fine art papers. Those are cotton base. RC, traditional surface, that was often from back in the darkroom. Your glossy, your luster, your semi-gloss, that sort of thing. Canvas. <coughs> Washi is a traditional Japanese paper. It's usually mulberry fiber. Um, some of them have long fibers, some of them have short fibers and more of a velvety look. And then specialty papers are slick rock metallics, the white and the silver. So what do you want to consider when you're, I'll, I'll get you in a minute. What do you want to consider when you're choosing papers? Tooth and surface texture, especially if you're looking at a rag. Do you want a whole lot of texture? Do you want a little bit of texture? Do you want a velvet finish? Um, there's a lot of discussion in photography and in the fine art market about optical brighteners. I get a lot of phone calls about it. The, the quick rundown on optical brighteners is there's something that's added to the paper to make it look whiter. What they do is they absorb ultraviolet light and they broadcast it out as visible blue light, which we see as whiter when it comes out of a paper. They break down over time. The more they get used, the faster they break down. So if you leave a print out in the sun, you're going to wear out those optical brighteners in a hurry. Now as they wear out, nothing changes. The print doesn't change. The paper doesn't change. It just looks a little less blue. And if you frame a print behind museum glass, UV filtering glass, this process is going to take years, if not decades. So unless you were to make the same print 40 years from now and hold it up, you're not going to notice the difference. And if you're framing your prints with optical brighteners behind museum glass, it's filtering out all the UV, so you're not even going to see that effect anyway. So you, you hear a lot about it. I get a lot of calls about it. It's mostly an academic discussion. If you're an archivist at a museum, it's a big deal. If they're the rest of us printing photos, you know, in 50, 60, 80 years, they're going to have a hard time finding me to complain that my print doesn't look <laughs> exactly the way it did the day they bought it. Um, How's the ink deal, detail? How's the tone? How's the saturation? Paper is a personal preference, but get to know them so you know what you like. Cost is always a factor. If you're giving away a lot of prints to your relatives, if you can afford to do it on the most expensive paper out there, great. Most of us buy the luster, the exhibition luster for my friends, and I buy the Entrada or the Juniper if I'm going to frame it or if I want a more serious print. Again, what are you going to do with it? If you're going to sell it on the fine art market, Put it on the best paper you can afford because that buyer will appreciate the paper on the print. Personal preference. And how does the paper affect the image? I typically wouldn't print a foggy day on a metallic paper because you're taking a nice, soft, surreal scene and you're putting it on a piece of aluminum, basically. You're kind of negating the feel of the photograph. So use your paper selection to extend how the image made you feel, how you want the viewer to feel when they look at your image. It's a tool, and it was a tool that we took very seriously back in the darkroom, and it's a tool now with 
the inks and the papers that are available that we can take very seriously again. They're, the substrates are varied, the image quality is good on all of them, and you can really use your paper selection to finish off that image and to have a print that is what you had in your head when you took that photograph. So along with the, the question of the optical brighteners, how long will my prints last? Right now, they're going to last a very long time. We've come a long ways. Uh, a lot of you probably had prints made at the drugstore or the Ritz camera or the Kitz camera 20 years ago. They probably don't look so good now. A mini lab print is not going to last that long, 25, 30 years before it really starts to shift. In the past, a lot of printers were dye-based inks. Now it's usually just the entry-level one. A dye-based inkjet print treated properly, we can expect a, a medium lifespan from. I'm going to guess, you know, 40, 50, 60 years before it starts to change, stored properly, mishandled, obviously a lot less time. Pigment-based prints are what you're going to get out of most of your printers, and it's what you're definitely going to want to sell if you're selling prints. The best guess for pigment-based prints on a cotton paper is that they're going to go 100, 150, 200 years. Uh, there's a company out there that does accelerated testing where they shine an incredibly bright light on it and they heat it up and they give it a bunch of humidity for a couple of months and they say, oh, that's equivalent to 100 years. <laughs> that's all the testing methods we have right now. So these are our best guesses, but cotton papers were very common in the darkroom and if you didn't get enough of the chemicals rinsed off, even though it was a stable process, you know, your print might start to look purple after a couple of days. But with today's inks and and a good cotton paper, you can be very confident that the print that you're giving away or the print that you're selling is going to outlast you for sure. What outlasts our inkjet prints? Some gelatin silver prints from earlier in the century and the oil paintings that we have at the Louvre. Those are the two guaranteed. The oil paintings are the guaranteed media if you want something to last 400 years. A lot of you have probably all had family photos do this. So this is something that you don't have to worry about with your inkjet prints as long as you treat them well after you've made them. So things that affect print life, as we talked about the type of paper, the type of ink, uh, exposure to UV. Humidity is another killer of prints, especially in this climate. Um, try not to leave your prints in your, in your unclimate controlled garage for very long. They're not going to take that very well. Handling, you have a lot of oils on your hands. If you can, uh, move your paper around, frame it with a pair of just really lightweight cotton gloves. Make sure that your framing materials are a neutral pH. If you buy an inexpensive frame at Aaron Brothers and you crack it open, there's a piece of cardboard in there and that's what you're supposed to back your photo with. Well, you're taking this nice uh, pH balanced neutral photo paper and you're sticking cardboard from who knows where in the back of that. That photo paper is going to suck all of the toxins out of that cardboard because it's balanced and the cardboard just wants to throw that there. So if you're going to take the time to frame something, put it on like a rising museum board, a cotton board that's pH balanced just like the picture is. That's going to do you wonders for the life of your prints when they're in the frame. And if you're going to sell your prints, obviously use the best materials possible. Make friends with a frame shop, get their advice, that sort of thing. And that way, when you deliver that print to the customer, you know that you've done everything that you can to ensure that they're getting the best product that they can get. And before you frame a print, give it at least 24 hours to sit out and off gas. 48 hours is best. The, the solutions that the inks are made out of are mostly alcohol. So it's dry when it comes out of the printer, but all that stuff needs to evaporate out of the paper. So if you can, give it two full days of just sitting on a flat surface, relaxing. So how do we make our prints last longer? UV filter. If you're not going to frame them, store them in an archival box. Uh, a, again, a pH neutral, fabric lined. Uh, the Chinley boxes that we sell are a great way to do it. Control the humidity, allow it to dry. And if you're going to have a canvas or a rag that you're not going to put glass over, use a UV protectant spray. It doesn't change the image at all, but it gives it some of that UV resistance, some humidity resistance, some fingerprint resistance, that sort of thing. Ours is the desert varnish. And as kind of a final, use your inkjet prints to, to create art with. These are infinitely repeatable. So feel free to take them. And I have a friend that does woven, that does folded. 
cut them up, stitch them back together. You can paint on them, you can watercolor on them, you can color your black and whites. Make this part of your, of your art, your artistic process. And if you screw one up, put it in the bin and start again. You have all your settings, you can just make the next one right there. You don't have to make sure your developer is still at 68 before you go running back in there to get one last print. Uh, we have a full line of papers. I have some sample prints of all of them. If you have questions about paper samples, you know, paper types, that sort of thing, come and see me afterwards. I'm happy to chat it with you about everything that I know, and, and hopefully I'll learn something from all of you, too. The Juniper is our newest paper. It's been out about a year. It's a Barita, which was a really common paper in the darkroom. What that means is it's a 100% cotton base with a Barita coating and then the inkjet layer on top of that. Black and white color, it looks fantastic. Um, that's a great place to start if you're looking for kind of a traditional photographic look, but with an inkjet paper. And back to the sample box, two sheets of everything. They're all labeled on the back. You don't have to keep them in the right order when you put them in the printer. Get one of these or two if you want extra sheets and play with it and really get to know your prints, your style, your photographs, what you like. That's about it. So just to look back, make friends with your printer. Don't be afraid of it. Yes, you'll probably have to buy it a set of inks, but once you've used that set of inks, you know, you've been on that first date, you've gotten through dinner, you've gotten through the conversation, you'll, you'll get to know each other and, and you'll understand a lot more about how the process works. Test different papers. Obviously, do your color management, do your paper types, every print that you make. Keep your notes. And ask questions. That's what all of us are here for in the business. Call up your fellow photographers. Come to your, come to your photo store. We're all here to help you. There's no, there's no secrets in printing. At least there shouldn't be. And, and use all these tools to make this part of your creative process and put those prints back up on the wall. Um, if you have questions, that's my email address. We have forums on our website. Reach out if you're stuck. I get a lot of people that call in on the phone and they say, I've been beating this problem for three hours, and in five minutes we can find a fix. So try not to, try not to muscle your printer into submission <laughs> and have it be one little checkbox that you missed. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. I hope this was valuable. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.